All right, yesterday we talked a little bit about just the general themes of philosophy. You should know those terms. It's kind of the starting point. Ontology, epistemology, axiology, and be able to tell me briefly what each one of those has to do with. Where do we start a study of philosophy? Generally speaking, people would say philosophy began with a group of thinkers who were largely associated with the Greek world, although none of them were in Greece. Okay? Uh, they were in two regions of the world that sort of sandwich Greece. One is known as Italy, one is known as Ionia, or Asia Minor. Have you already heard this lecture? You're just, uh, I'm just lip syncing. Uh, Avery's actually giving the lecture back there. So, uh, if we look at a map, this is not a map intended to teach this point, but you all have some idea of this. Uh, here's the Greek peninsula here. Ionia would be over here, of course. Asia Minor, part of what we would call today Western Turkey. And Italy is over here. All of these thinkers are called pre-Socratics. Why are they called pre-Socratics? Why that catchy title applied to these people? Exactly. So the pre-Socratic philosophers, and usually that's where people start. And so that's where we're going to start, because I don't want to be different from most people. The place we're going to begin is with Ionia. Now I say these are Greeks, and they are Greek people, but they're not in Greece. So I want you to dig back down into those file cabinets of your education here. How is it that there were Greek people living in Asia Minor? What happened in history that caused that population, Greek folks, to be living there? And they'd been living there for some time. And the answer is, Mr. Dupree? Well, all I remember us talking about is that they just started moving out and colonizing different areas. They did. There was a period of kind of mass migration. Uh, but this is actually prior to that. This is, uh, that, that period of kind of Greek migration is usually associated with the 8th, 7th, 6th centuries BC. This is earlier than that. That there was a separate population there and you did study this and you learned it from me. So now, my self-image is on the line. How did there come to be Greek people in Ionia many hundreds of years earlier than that period of migration? Spencer? Well, I remember studying something about Greek colonization. No, I think that's what Trevor just said. Now, can you improve on that? Oh, um, I, maybe something to do with the Olympics. Ah, uh, 776? No, but nice try. Thanks for playing. Okay, over here, uh, Krista. Does it have to do with the wars with the Persians against Xerxes? No, because that's actually later than all of this. That's down around the 400s. All right, okay, Trevor, please. My hopes are pinned on you, my son. I think they left colonies in Ionia during the Trojan War. Oh, you're awfully close. You are, um, yes, that's actually not quite the Trojan War, but you're awfully close to the right answer. You're certainly in the right time frame. All right. If, uh, I don't know if, when I went to Greece with the class, you know, that I went with some years back, um, the uh, tour guide that we had at Mycenae asked a question. And the question was, what do you think is one of the most important dates, uh, maybe the most important date that little Greek kids learn when they go to school in Greece? And nobody knew. And I have to admit, I actually was not sure what the answer would be myself. Although when I heard it, I thought, duh, you know, you should know that. Uh, it wasn't the Trojan War, although it's certainly in that time frame, but it was the date of the blank invasion. Is that what you're going to give me, Jacob? The Dorian, the Dorian invasion. Yeah, Sarah knew it. She's, oh, goodness, I knew that. And the Dorian invasion 
is usually tied to about the middle of the 12th century. That is about the year 1140, 1130 BC. It's after the Trojan War. The Dorians come in. These are Indo-Europeans. They come from the north, from Heraclea and other places to the north of Greece. Drive out the Mycenaeans who had already been living there in places like Mycenae. And they pushed them out of the Peloponnese and drove them to other parts of the ancient world. Many of them wound up in a little town that came to be called Athena, you know, or Athens. But many were driven beyond that and wound up other places. Many of them wound up in Ionia. Hence the name Ionia is a Greek name that was applied to a region that was not Greek by tradition. Where, for example, was the Greek poet Homer from? Do you know what his hometown was? Homer was from, was he, was he from Greece? No. Most famous Greek poet in history was not from Greece. It was from Ionia. The city of, anybody know the city? Smyrna. Smyrna, also mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. All right? There's a little... There's a little shrine to Homer in that city that you can find to this day. All right, so the point is, this is the first class of philosophers we want to look at. And these are called then, curiously enough, the Ionian philosophers. So we're going to learn some names of some Ionian philosophers. And tomorrow, if all goes well, we will come back and learn the names of some Italian philosophers. We're going to move through this pretty fast because these guys are important but not that important and I have a lot of ground to cover so I just want you to have some name recognition. There's four names associated with these um, Ionian philosophers. The first of them is the name Thales. How many recognize the name Thales? Oh, please. Uh, I, do, I mention him in Bible context. Thank you, Avery. And would you mind giving us a little five-minute rehearsal of what uh, Thales was about? Well, <laughs> Thales was a very important Ionian philosopher. Excellent answer, yes. That everything originated from water. That's very good, see? <laughs> see, he knew more than he was learning. That's exactly right. And where did you learn that, my son? I did, did, you didn't learn that from me? Common knowledge. Common knowledge. Good. Excellent. Well, how many, pe how many people knew that Thales taught that everything can be boiled down to water? Water is the only thing that... Pardon me? Is that, oh, that's probably right. Yeah, that's probably where you got it. Okay. Next one, Anaximander. A little tougher name. Next one, Anaximenes. And then finally, and by far most importantly, the last of them, is a guy by the name of Heraclitus. I want to give you the dates for these guys, but I will not hold you to knowing uh, the dates except for two of them. So I'm going to give you four sets of dates, but only two do you need to know. Thales is 624 to 546. I do want you to know him. Anaximander is 610 to 547, but I'll never test you on that. That's just for your personal amazement. Next one is Anaximenes. He's 585 to 528. I'm sorry, 585. 528. I won't test you on that. Last one I do want you to know is Heraclitus, 535, 475.
Cinque. Grazie. All right. We do touch on Thales briefly in Bible context. Does anybody recall where Thales pops up? A little cameo appearance by Thales in Bible context. No dice? I'll just remind you of this. It's, it's a battle that took place in 585. Ding a ling a ling. No bells ringing. It's a battle that's called the Battle of the Eclipse. Ding a ling a ling. <laughs> <laughs> bong, bong. <laughs> Trying to get you. All right. There was a battle that was fought between the Medians and a Median king named Syaxares. Ding a ling a ling. Okay, we got, we got that. Syaxares had made a deal, you may recall, uh, with the Babylonians. In, uh, you know, when they had taken over uh, Assyria and the city of Asher itself had fallen, they cut a little deal outside the walls of Asher in which Syaxares gave his daughter, Amatus, to the Babylonian crown prince whose name was Nebuchadnezzar. Huh? And they formed an alliance. The Medians and the Babylonians took over all of the Assyrian world and then split it up like a pie. From a biblical point of view, we're more interested in Nebuchadnezzar because he ran down and attacked Jerusalem and uh, you know all of that. But Syaxares, the Median, went on his own campaign and his campaign took him, you know, it took him across Turkey and he attacked a region over here that was called Lydia. And the king of Lydia at the time was a guy named Gyges. And that battle went on for four years, but it ended in 585. And it ended because a certain guy came along by the name of Thales. And said, and by the way, he's Ionian, so he is part of this Lydian empire. And he goes out and says, the gods are so upset with you two forces for fighting here that to give you a warning that you better stop your fighting, God is going to make the sun, or the gods are going to make the sun go dark. And he's going to do it Thursday at 3 p.m. Well, that sounds cool, but if the sun doesn't go dark Thursday, 3 p.m., you know, that uh, Thales uh, has a problem. Well, Thales, of course, is a brilliant, brilliant astronomer, mathematician, and he, of course, had already computed that was the time when what would happen? What? A solar eclipse, a complete eclipse. And he knew it was coming. He'd known it was coming for months, but he thought, what a, you know, this is my way to get this battle ended. So he goes out and he makes that proclamation and everybody kind of wonders, whoa. And they wait and sure enough, Thursday, 3 p.m., there's a total eclipse of the sun. Everybody goes home. They form a truce. It's the end of the battle. They're so terrified that the gods are angry with them that they go home. Nobody knows that it was all just Thales doing a little mathematics in his back room that generated that. So that's called the Battle of the Eclipse. And it is where Thales, of course, makes a name for himself. And many people would say, and I'm not going to argue with them at this point, that this is the guy that really represents the beginning of philosophy. All right. So if you ask who was the, you know, at least in many quarters, if you ask the question, who was the first philosopher, the answer would be Thales. Uh, and he was brilliant. Now you may think, well, he doesn't sound so brilliant to me when you hear that he, as Avery reminded us, believes everything is made of water. But give him a break. He's a pretty bright guy. I mean, when, when was the last time you looked at the sky and figured out when the next solar eclipse was going to happen? You know? He had a pretty smart brain thing in his head, as they say. All right. So anyway, that's, uh, that's Thales. Thales is the first then of several. Uh, to, and I want to say a little more about him in a minute, but let me just talk about all these guys for a moment. 
uh, all four of them shared certain common beliefs. So when we talk about the Ionian pre-Socratics, there are four basic beliefs that they all shared. All of these would be points at which the Italian philosophers disputed with them. So these are distinctively Ionian, pre-Socratic notions. First, they were naturalists. They were naturalistic, which is pretty amazing, actually. What do you suppose that means? Jordan, what does it mean to say that a person is a naturalist? You could actually buy more time by doing a complete sentence. Well, the use of the word naturalism implies, see all the time it gives you to think about your answer. Uh, but anyway, here we are. What is a naturalist? A naturalist would be a person. Don't, now don't, don't do an impersonification, don't do an impression of Gore when you're answering it. You can do Ingard if you want. Do Gore. Uh, <laughs> That was good yesterday, by the way. I was, uh, I was quite impressed. I knew Ingard within the first three seconds of your... Uh, I'm really not sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Killed all that time for nothing. What is a naturalist? Anybody? What is a naturalist? You all know that. I mean, you've studied this in, with Mr. Dykstra, I imagine, probably. He's talked about this. What would a naturalist be? Avery, go ahead. That's right. Nature as opposed to what? Nature is set over against what as an alternative explanation for stuff. They don't believe that there's any God or anything. That's right. Read naturalism as something like atheism. These Ionian philosophers, interestingly enough, at a time when the whole world was sold out to a lot of, you know, very polytheistic and, and uh, mythological ideas, they really were the first people to come along and say, you know, I think things happen just by way of natural forces. They are really the first natural scientists. They try to figure out the explanations of things based on perceivable forces rather than gods, you know, and supernatural spirits and stuff like that. And as far as we can tell, nobody in history had ever tried to do that. Now, we disagree with them at, at the point of their atheism, but we kind of agree with them at the point that they're not just finding little demons and spooks and gods under every bush and around every corner. You know, they're really trying to explain things in terms of normal, what we would call scientific explanation. So, they're naturalists. They are materialists. What does that mean? say that uh, they are materialists, somebody besides Mr. Cheely back there. What do you think, Stephen? Not that I don't like Mr. Cheely, but he's sort of... Um, materialists. Materialists. Maybe they thought that having a lot of possessions was like the highest... Ah, okay, yeah, they were materialistic. Not exactly. It's more the philosophical use of this word than you'd say the ethical use. A materialist is someone that just likes to get a lot of stuff at Christmas time, you know. But at this point, the materialist was more philosophical, and it means, Nicole? That they would maybe trust something that they can touch and see and touch more. Yes, that's true. They trusted it more. That is, trusted things they could see or touch, but it goes a little further than that. Anybody want to finish that thought out? Sydney? That's right. Okay. All that exists is material. There is no spirit. There's no unseen. This goes with the naturalism, but it's a little bit of a different twist or you know, angle on it. All that is is matter, and matter is eternal. There has always been matter, and we are simply living in one particular kind of you know, fluctuation of matter resulting from natural forces. 
but there's no God out there. Okay, materialists. These people are not too far from a lot of 20th century, 21st century American academics. You know, it's pretty, pretty up to date in some ways. Yes? How would they, would they say that humans have always been around, or would they take no. like evolutionary they, uh, Some of them took an evolutionary approach. In fact, one of these guys was the inventor of the theory of evolution. Okay. We'll get to him in a second. All right, uh, the next one is a word you may be less familiar with. It's the word monist. They were monists. Naturalists, materialists, monists. Any takers on that one? What is monism? Going once. What do you think, Jacob? Let's take an intelligent guess. What do you suppose a monist would be in connection with these terms? Well, I remember that Mr. Nason told us something about it. Yeah? Good. Good. But I don't remember. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> Isn't it great to have just kind of a little bell in your head? You go, you know, I knew something about that once. I can't tell you, I, there's not a day that goes by in my life that I don't have that experience. I knew something about that. Please, Sarah. I think when we talked about it before, it was God is in everything and everything is God. Okay, that's kind of pantheistic monism, and so that's a form of monism, yeah. All right, monism in, its, in and of itself is simply this, that everything that exists can be reduced to one common substance. You know, there's only one stuff out of which everything is made. If you know the word elements, you know, we think there's what? 96 elements or what? How many elements are there today? It seems like it keeps changing. 112, all right, periodic table and all that. All right, so we think there's 112 elements. Well, the monist said there was one element, just one. And then the dispute among them was, okay, what is that element? Thales says it's water. Somebody else says it's something else. But it's all still reducible to one thing. And then the final one is uh, a little bit of a different kind of word. And uh, I would just keel over in a dead faint uh, if anyone actually told me what this means. But hey, I'm willing to do it. You know. Hylozoism. Hilo, H-Y-L-O-Z-O-I-S-M, they were hylozoists, in other words. Uh, if you'd like to make it rhyme with the other words up here, which of course is our highest priority. They were hylozoists. Anybody? I'm ready to fall over in a dead faint. I'm ready to have a charismatic experience that you'll remember for the rest of your life. Can anybody tell me what hylozoism is? Oh, no takers. All right. Hylozoism is simply an idea associated with water. They all, they all subscribe to this. Thales was the one who made it famous. That water has the power of motion. So that's the, it is in a sense living. Uh, it, water is a living thing. Or at least it can move on its own. I was with my wife where were we? We were just, within the last couple of weeks, we were, I don't know if it was Lake Coeur d'Alene, somewhere where there was a pretty good sized body of water. Oh, it was uh, out at the cabin, out at uh, um, the writing, wonderful place out there, you know. Uh, so we were looking out over at Coeur d'Alene Lake, and it was just moving, and it, the wind wasn't blowing, but you look at a lake and it's moving. You ever notice that? It's just, and, and you think, why is it moving? Now we know, we can give explanations, well, there's stuff going on, but really it's kind of mysterious. The waves just keep moving. And I turned to my wife and I said, doesn't that just prove hylozoism? And she just looks at me like, why did I marry you? I mean, I, I always see that look on her face, you know, like, why can't you just talk like a normal human? You know, why do you, <laughs> so, I don't know. She stays with me, but I think it's some kind of experiment in, <laughs> you know, she's, 
So anyway, I was trying to explain it to her like she cared, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> but you care. I, I can't test her, but I can test you on this, you know. So, so hylozoism is this idea that water has within it this power of motion. And they didn't understand gravity the way Newton explained it and so on. Or, you know, they just saw the water moving. They saw rivers running and they saw the ocean crashing against the, the uh, reefs. And, you know, and they, they saw that and it looked like water had this kind of power of life. So that's, that term, hylozoism, is uh, basically connected to that. All right. Well, those, those, you, you need to know those terms and know that they're associated with the Ionian philosophers. Let's take a very brief look at these individual guys. Thales we've talked about as far as the uh, Battle of the Eclipse. The reason that he felt that water was the fundamental essence, and that's the word you want to know. Remember, we're talking about being, essence, the fundamental stuff, ontology. The reason that Thales thought that water is this fundamental stuff, this substratum of reality, is because he saw water capable of doing several things that he felt accounted for life as we perceive it. Now having said that, can anyone take a stab? What do you suppose was it about water that made Thales think this must be that fundamental reality? Kayla? <laughs> do you like to drink water sometimes? I see you have some in front of you there. Yeah. Why do you drink that stuff? Mm hmm. She wants to keep herself hydrated. That's very good. And Kayla, why do you wish to keep yourself hydrated? So that I don't get sick. So you don't get sick. That's good. And what sort of sickness? might uh, infect you if you weren't sufficiently hydrated? Uh, probably the flu. You get the flu, maybe. What else happens? If you just don't drink water for a while, what begins to happen? You get thirsty. You get thirsty because your body wants water, doesn't it? And when you really want water, a milkshake doesn't cut it, does it? You really want water. If you don't drink water for a long time, what will eventually happen to you? you will die. That's right. <laughs> How important is water to your existence? Very important. Very important. What do you suppose, Kayla, was the inference that Thales drew from that observation that if you don't put water on things, they die? What, what did he conclude from that? Well, you always need it. You need it that water is essential for life. That's right. He notices that if you plant a seed, you've got to water it. You have to water people, you have to water plants, you have to water anything if you want to see life. When you deprive something of water, it will die, you know? And so one of the things he thought was that whatever else water does or accounts for, I know that you can't get along without it as far as this whole universe of life is concerned. All right, now that's a start. What else do you suppose would have been observations Thales makes about water that lead him to believe that it's a fundamental level of reality for all of life? Nicole? Isn't it, pure and clean? it certainly purifies and cleans, and so you would, you would think that, yes. That's not one of his notions, but I think it should be on the list. You know, If there were four on it, that would probably be it. But that's very good, good observation. What else? Go ahead, Krista. Yeah, okay, tell me what you mean by that. Forms. That's exactly right. So Thales said he noticed that what, oops, <laughs> higher math, I'm kind of, you know. Three forms. And think about that. You know, how many things do you know of that can be both in the form of a solid and in the form of a liquid and in the form of a gas? You know, water qualifies, doesn't it? And so when he looks at the universe, he sees that everything seems to be in one of those three forms and that water is the most obvious 
I think that that can take all three forms. He didn't worry about the fact that ice has to be cold. He, you know, that's beside the point. It's just it could be in that form, so that was sufficient for him. The last one was the one I alluded to, that water moves. This hylozoism idea. What they're trying to find is the fundamental stuff. Remember yesterday I said one branch of philosophy is ontology. What is real? Every one of us in this room has an ontology. Every one of us. If I sat down and talked to you for five minutes, I could figure out from every one of you what is your fundamental ontology. Now, if you're a Christian, it's probably been informed by your Christian faith, so you would give answers that would somehow relate to God and so on. But everybody's got an ontology. These guys basically are atheists. But they are nevertheless still trying to figure out what's real. And so they're answering this ontological question. And the answer that Thales gives for that is water. All right, so Thales, let's uh, move fairly rapidly. These two guys are not as important to me, but I want you to know their names. I want you to at least tie them to the Ionian philosophers. Anaximander was a, was a student of Thales. These guys all you know, hung out together. Uh, smoked something together, I don't know why. But, you know, they, uh, but anyway, he was a student of... <laughs> yeah, well, these are, the, these are pagans, you know, so we're not worried. So uh, he is sometimes a, uh, uh, given the distinction of having invented the sundial. He certainly invented a sundial. But the Babylonians had done so many years earlier. We don't know if he stole it from the Babylonians, but he independently probably came up with a sundial. He is the guy, there's two things about him that you want to tuck away in those little memory banks of yours. One, his answer to this question of essence was to first disagree with his master Thales. He didn't think water quite got it there because he thought that in, even though he's a naturalist and a materialist, he still thinks the fundamental stuff is a little less material. And so he gives a term that is best rendered by boundless. And I don't know what else to tell you about that. It's just, it's the boundless. That's the Greek word. But it's, it's like an undefined substance that is behind everything. But it's not any particular thing. It's, it's actually quite sophisticated, somewhat surprising that he came up with it. The more obvious thing he came up with, and I mentioned this a minute ago, was he was the first, as far as we know, the first evolutionist. So he's the first Darwinian before there was Darwin. He came up with the idea that, of course, there is material, and it kind of gradually develops into various forms, and we just happen to be one of those forms. All right, so that's number two. Third guy, Anaximenes. He says, this is the only thing I want you to know about him, one point for Anaximenes, he says, the fundamental stuff is air. He understands air. He can feel it when he waves his hands around. There's that stuff, that kind of fluid. You feel it, you know? And he realizes you can, you can, it can be rarefied. It can be compressed. And he thinks air is a better answer than Thales' water. Do you see something coming? What's, what is, what's the great famous definition of the elements according to the Greeks, Nicole? Right. Well, that's where it's coming from. Thales gives us water. See? Anaximenes gives us air. We're going to have some others coming down the pike here pretty soon. But, but these, that's where these uh, original notions came from. And then finally, Heraclitus. Heraclitus is the one who you want more than any of the rest to uh, understand. He's sometimes called the weeping philosopher of Ephesus. The same Ephesus that you know of from the Bible many years earlier. He says the fundamental stuff is fire. 
So the earth, air, fire, and water. He gives us the fire idea. He says, and this is his most famous contribution, that everything is always, always in flux. The only thing you can depend on is there's nothing you can depend on. It's always changing. He famously said, you never step into the same river twice. Excuse me, Mr. Cheeley? That sounded profound. I need to hear that. That's Pocahontas. <laughs> What is that from a Disney movie or? She sings the song and she says that line. You know, you know, the nice thing about taking this class is you begin to realize how much popular culture uses those. I didn't know that was in, but uh, but it's uh, they got that straight from Heraclitus. It is this. Uh, you, you all feel it. It's the trauma of being always in a feeling in a place of change. I want to do a little experiment with you just to illustrate that. I've got a, a watch with a sweep second hand on. I know some of you can't see it. You can see the second hand ticking away there. Where is it right now, Trevor? Uh, it's just near the bottom. Near the bottom. I want you to think about the moment that's going to happen in 30 seconds when my second hand is right at the 12. I want you to especially pay attention to that moment in time. It is still 20 seconds out. It is still in your future. Does it exist yet, Megan? No. No, it is future. It may never come. The Earth may end in less than 10 seconds. But here it comes. You ready for it? We're five seconds out. Think. Here it is. Three, two, one. It's over. Do you realize it's gone forever? Just a moment ago, it, would, it did not exist because it was future. Now it does not exist because it is past. And how long was that moment? How long was it? It was infinitely short, wasn't it? Just like that. And Heraclitus feels that all the time. He feels life just slipping by all the time. You can't hang on to anything. It's always changing. I started teaching here at the Oaks roughly 10 years ago. I think I'm in my ninth year, so something you know, pretty close to 10 years. Do you know, I can look at pictures of myself when I first started teaching here and I can see that I have aged. I have. In the 10 years I've been here, I look like a younger man to myself when I look at pictures from 10 years back. You ever notice that, Mr. Williams? And, and you think about, I've aged, but that didn't happen overnight. I didn't get up one morning and look and go, I'm 10 years older. You know, I didn't happen that way. It happened gradually, but I think if I looked at it closely, I could almost see the change year by year, and sometimes I think I could see it month by month. Or even I'm getting older. But I got bad news for you. Sarah, so are you. You know? Yeah, I mean, you young ladies in this class, I hate to tell you this, but in the time that you've been sitting here in this lecture, <laughs> microscopic wrinkles have been developing. You don't see them yet. You live in this silly delusion that you're going to be youthful forever. Forget it! And doesn't that kind of, doesn't that, doesn't that alarm, isn't there something in you that just kind of feels, it creates anxiety. This is called, in much more, much later philosophical jargon, existential anxiety. But Heraclitus, who never heard of existential anxiety, knew what it felt like. He felt this constant flux. And you can't grab anything. It's always slipping through your fingers. You know. 
And that's why he's called the weeping philosopher. Because for him, ultimately, there's no hope. There's just this endless, ongoing change. But the last thought here in the last minute or so, Heraclitus gave us a term. He's the first guy in Greek history we know of to use a term that was later picked up in the New Testament as one of its most important theological ideas. Heraclitus is the first guy to use this term. And the term is, anybody know? What would you guess the term is? I'll give you a little more of a hint. Heraclitus noticed that while there's all this change going on, the change seems to happen according to some rational principle. Something seems to be guiding it in a reasonable kind of way, even though there's all this change. And the term he applied to that principle of rationality that he sort of saw in things was the term, Mr. Demmel. No, <laughs> well, no, not quite that, but I thought you were going to say it. Whoa, <laughs> but it was the term. <laughs> Anybody got it? It's the coherency principle. We actually talked about it last year in doctrine. Logos. Logos. John says, in the beginning was what? The Logos. Well, the first guy to give us that notion is Heraclitus. Now, I'm not saying Heraclitus was a Christian or anything like that. I'm just saying he's the first guy to use that term. Well, unfortunately, the boss is sitting here and he's noticed that I haven't finished five minutes early to do the requisite review, so, you know, we'll review tomorrow, first thing off. <laughs> All right, thank you much.